Welcome to the module, Oncology Practice Management. I am Dr. Christopher Fossil from Indiana University Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. This presentation is part of the ASHP ACCP Oncology Pharmacy Specialty Review Course, which is designed for pharmacists seeking to obtain recertification credit or update their knowledge and skills in preparation for board certification. The activity is designed to be interactive with questions posed to you at several points. I will pause to allow you time to consider on how you would answer the question. You may wish to write down your answer and correct the response in your handout. The disclosures are displayed on this slide. The learning objectives for this presentation are first, to evaluate oncology pharmacy services for compliance with established regulations, professional practice standards, and procedures for handling and disposal of hazardous drugs. Second, to select quality improvement activities that enhance the safety and effectiveness of medication use processes in oncology patient care. And third, to explain national accreditation and federal regulatory requirements for the care of cancer patients receiving chemotherapy or other hazardous drugs. There are additional learning objectives which will only be covered in the handout and not in this slide presentation. They include explaining medication reimbursement and patient assistant programs to optimize drug availability for oncology patients, and to evaluate policies and procedures related to conducting research involving investigational drugs, including drug management in patients with cancer. There are two summaries of both standards from HOPA and ASHP for investigational drug services, which are comprehensively covered within the handout. The following is the presentation outline for this module. First, we will talk about compliance and practice standards, followed by quality metrics and oncology, payment models, drug reimbursement, and niche practice areas for oncology pharmacy, such as specialty pharmacy. Let's get started with an audience response question. Which of the following is most correct about practice settings in which USP 800 applies? Choice A, it only applies in hospitals. Choice B, every setting in which hazardous drugs are handled by personnel. Choice C, in hospitals and ambulatory infusion clinics, but not veterinary clinics. Or choice D, it only applies to licensed personnel. The correct answer for audience response question number one was choice B, every setting in which hazardous drugs are handled by personnel. The history of having standards for the handling of hazardous drugs dates back to over three decades ago. The American Society of Health System Pharmacists was a pioneering organization with publishing standards for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians to adhere to with respect to handling hazardous drugs. And they did so for the first time in 1990. They have since updated those published standards in 2006 and again in 2018. In 2004, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health or NIOSH, which is an arm of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention of the federal government, published its first safety alert. It was aimed at preventing occupational exposures to antineoplastic and other hazardous drugs in healthcare settings. NIOSH has also established a program where they would list 
anti-neoplastic and other hazardous drugs in healthcare settings. The most recent final publication of this was in 2016. Prior to that, they had been updating the list every two years. Currently on the NIOSH website, there is a draft version of an update from 2020. However, it is not yet finalized. The United States Pharmacopeia published Chapter 797, which focused on pharmaceutical compounding for sterile preparations, which in its initial publication included a section on hazardous drugs. It has since been revised and posted in June of 2019 to remove that section. The United States Pharmacopeia Chapter 800, which focuses explicitly on hazardous drug handling in healthcare settings, was published and finalized in 2016. The official compliance date for USP 800 was December of 2019. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the ASHP guidelines for handling hazardous drugs were updated in 2018. The main focus of this revision is that the standards that were published in USP 800 were included in the recommendations for this document. There was extensive revisions in the sections on engineering controls and the use of personal protective equipment guided by the USP 800 guidelines. And there was extensive discussion on medical surveillance, robotics, and environmental sampling for hazardous drugs. Now, I'm going to focus the bulk of my presentation for handling hazardous drugs on the USP 800 standards, which are forthcoming in the next group of slides. However, the details with respect to the ASHP guidelines are covered in the handout, and I would suggest that you take a hard look at those because those are going to be fair game for the exam. I'd like to take a moment to describe the scope of the USP 800 chapter. The standards apply to areas where hazardous drugs are compounded, stored, transported, and administered. The facilities that are covered include hospitals, pharmacies, physician offices, patient clinics, and veterinarian offices. Healthcare personnel that are covered include pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, physicians and physician assistants, nurses and home health care workers, and veterinarians and veterinary technicians. Let's do audience response question number two. Which of the following characteristics is essential to qualify a drug as being labeled as hazardous? A, myelosuppression. B, genotoxicity, C, mucositis, or D, immune-mediated hepatitis. The correct answer to audience response question number two is B, genotoxicity. The definition of a hazardous drug has been established both by NIOSH and by ASHP. These definitions from both organizations largely overlap. And they include the characteristics of carcinogenicity, teratogenicity, reproductive toxicity, serious organ toxicity at low doses, and genotoxicity. Now, the NIOSH definition also includes structure and toxicity profile of new agents that mimic existing drugs as determined to be hazardous with the above criteria. The USP 800 chapter outlines the chain of custody of hazardous drugs once they arrive at an institution. First, the institution receives the drug, like a loading dock. Then the drug is brought to storage. 
then to a pharmacy or a drug preparation area where it's compounded, dispensed, subsequently administered to a patient or an animal in the case of a veterinary clinic. And then lastly, it's disposed of as it exits an institution. As I alluded to previously, NIOSH publishes a list of hazardous drugs, the most recent of which, which was finalized, was in 2016. There is, again, a revision to that that was posted on the NIOSH website in 2020, but it has not yet been finalized, and I don't think it would be fair game for the exam, for this year at least, until it's a finalized version. So that being said, I think we're going to be responsible for the content which was in the 2016 version, of which there are three unique groups that NIOSH outlines. The first is group one, which is anti-neoplastic drugs. Group two is non-anti-neoplastic drugs, but they're deemed to be hazardous by meeting one of the NIOSH criteria for a hazardous drug. And group three are drugs that are considered to have just reproductive risks. The draft NIOSH hazardous drug list for 2020 encompasses some extensive revisions from the 2016 document. For example, groups one, two, and three are significantly modified. The draft document was posted for comment in the summer of 2020. We are still waiting on the final version with the comments to be published on the NIOSH website in which at that time it will be considered to be the latest update for which we will be responsible. But for the 2021 exam, if you're going to be sitting for it, I would focus on knowing the NIOSH 2016 hazardous drug list. Now, the USP 800 chapter requires that you maintain a hazardous drug list for your own institution. Now, you can you can use the NIOSH hazardous drug list if you want to and just use exactly what NIOSH has put out there. Or you can come up with your own. If you're going to come up with your own, there's a few things you have to bear in mind. First of which is you have to do an assessment of new drugs as they enter the marketplace. And there needs to be a recategorization of agents as new toxicologic data becomes available. If you're handling investigational drugs at your institution, you may want to consider labeling them as hazardous if the mechanism of action of a particular agent is similar to a class of drugs which are known to be hazardous. You would consider the dosage form and whether the dosage form would be altered, crushed, or compounded when making a designation as a hazardous drug. And of course, Hazardous drugs would have to be labeled in accordance with all applicable state and federal regulations. The USP 800 chapter outlines potential hazardous drug exposure risk points to healthcare workers. And this largely mirrors the progression of a hazardous drug throughout an institution as we outlined in the chain of custody of hazardous drugs in the previous slide. So during the receipt of a hazardous drug into an institution, during the dispensing process, during a spill event, either in a department such as a pharmacy department or out in a patient care area where patients and family members may be at risk in addition to our professional staff, transport of a hazardous drug throughout the institution poses a risk. And then lastly, in the disposal and waste process of a hazardous drug as it exits the institution, staff could be at risk for exposure. So getting into the weeds a little bit more with respect to the potential for hazardous drug exposure risk points as it relates specifically to compounding procedures. So handling of any oral dosage forms, which involves sometimes crushing, splitting tablets, or opening capsules, places staff at risk for hazardous drug exposure. Pouring oral or topical liquids from one container to another. Weighing or mixing components in a, in a compounding area. Reconstituting vials with uh, diluents. 
withdrawing or diluting injectable hazardous drugs from parenteral containers, expelling air from hazardous drugs that are in syringes, contacting hazardous drug reg residue that's present on PPE, other garments, or even surfaces which are used to prepare hazardous drugs, any of the cleaning procedures as it relates to an area that's involved with compounding hazardous drugs, and never forget that when you're doing maintenance activities of any of the engineering controls, either within the pharmacy space or in the ductwork above the ceiling, those folks that are actually doing that work would have to take appropriate precautions to make sure that they are not exposed. There are a number of potential risk points for our nursing colleagues that are administering hazardous drugs to patients. Aerosols can be generated during administration by various routes of a hazardous drug, not just intravenous administration. Performing certain specialized procedures such as administering a hazardous drug intraoperatively or intraperitoneal injection or intravesicular injection of a hazardous drug. And then lastly, priming an IV site. Other patient care activities in which staff may be placed at risk for contamination would be handling body fluids or contaminated clothing or other contaminated dressings. The USP 800 chapter provides some recommendations on how facilities for compounding hazardous drugs should be laid out. First off, hazardous drug handling areas must be designated as, as such with signage and having restrictions to authorize personnel only. The hazardous drug handling area should be located away from break rooms, refreshment areas, or anywhere where staff, patients, visitors, family members could possibly congregate. And designated areas must be available for receipt and unpacking of hazardous drugs, storage of hazardous drugs, non-sterile hazardous drug, and sterile hazardous drug compounding. The USP 800 chapter has established new standards for institutions to follow for the receipt of hazardous drugs. Anti-neoplastic hazardous drugs and all active pharmaceutical ingredients which are considered a hazardous drug must be unpacked, meaning you're removing them from their external shipping container in areas that are neutral or negative pressure relative to the surrounding areas. So hazardous drugs must no longer be unpacked from their external shipping containers in sterile compounding areas or in areas which are considered to be positive pressure, such as an anteroom. Following receipt of hazardous drugs in your institution, they have to be stored somewhere. So USP 800 provides some guidance with respect to that. First off, they prescribe some regulations with respect to the type of containers that hazardous drugs should be stored in. Secondly, they state that hazardous drugs that are not in a final dosage form must be segregated from other inventory in an externally ventilated negative pressure environment with at least 12 air changes per hour. Now, you may be able to store both sterile and non-sterile hazardous drugs together in that same area. Regarding hazardous drugs that require refrigeration, they must be stored in a dedicated unit in a negative pressure room with at least 12 air changes per hour. Reproductive risk only hazardous drugs and final dosage forms of antineoplastic hazardous drugs may be stored with other inventory. USP 800 notes the critical importance of engineering controls in trying to prevent cross and microbial contamination during all phases of compounding. And they specify three unique controls in order to carry that out. First off, they specify a containment primary engineering control or a CPEC, which is a ventilated device for direct handling of hazardous drugs, or as we more colloquially know as a hood. 
They also specify a containment secondary engineering control or CSEC, which is the room in which the CPEC is placed. So it's the IV room. And then thirdly, they specify supplemental engineering controls. So an example of a supplemental engineering control is a closed system transfer device. This brings us to our third audience response question. Which is the most appropriate setting for admixing hazardous drugs, which are compounded sterile products? A, a biologic safety cabinet in a positive pressure room. B, a biologic safety cabinet in a negative pressure room. C, a laminar airflow hood in a positive pressure room or D, a laminar airflow hood in a negative pressure room. The correct answer for audience response question number three is B, a biologic safety cabinet in a negative pressure room. USP 800 outlines how hazardous drugs should be compounded utilizing engineering controls properly. Examples of those are hazardous drugs must be compounded in a CPEC, aka a chemotherapy hood, in a CSEC, aka an IV room. CPECs must operate continuously and not be turned off at intermittent intervals. Non-sterile and sterile compounding should be segregated into their own CPECs. Laminar airflow workbenches or compounding aseptic isolators must not be used for compounding hazardous drugs. This table outlines the different types of primary engineering controls that are used to compound sterile products. On the left-hand side of the table, you have the type of primary engineering control, whether it's a conventional IV hood versus an isolator. In the middle column, you have the type of primary engineering control that is used to prepare non-hazardous compounded sterile products. So the conventional IV hood is a laminar airflow workbench. The isolator is a compounding aseptic isolator. And on the right-hand side of the table, you have primary engineering controls that are used to prepare hazardous drug compounded sterile products. So you have, for a conventional IV hood, a class II biologic safety cabinet. And for an isolator, you have a compounding aseptic containment isolator. Both the class II biologic safety cabinet and the compounding aseptic containment isolator require external venting in a negative pressure environment. This slide outlines the engineering controls for the sterile hazardous drug compounding per USP 800. And it does so in a table. So I'm going to walk you through the table. We're going to start on the left-hand side of the table under the configuration. The ISO 7 classified buffer room, buffer room meaning IV room, with an ISO classified 7 ante room. The requirements for CPEC are for it to be externally vented, and it has to be either a class 2 biologic safety cabinet or a compounding aseptic containment isolator. Requirements for the CSEC are, or the IV room are that it has to be externally vented, that it has 30 air changes per hour, and that it maintains a negative pressure between 0.01 and 0.03 inches of water column relative to the adjacent areas. For beyond use dating criteria, USP 800 refers back to the USP 797 chapter. For an unclassifiable state, so it doesn't have an ISO rating for its IV rooms, the CPEC requirements are the same as for a classified space, so it has to be an externally vented device, either a class II biologic safety cabinet or a compounding aseptic containment isolator, if it's an isolator. 
for the C-sec or the room, again, it has to be externally vented, but the air changes per hour, hour are down to 12, and it still has to maintain a negative pressurization between 0 0.01 and 0 0.03 inches of water column relative to the adjacent areas. And again, the beyond use dating criteria that the user is referred to the USP 797 chapter. This slide has USP 800 chapter recommended configurations for sterile hazardous drug compounding. On the left hand side of the slide is the first rendering which a ISO 7 buffer room that's under negative pressurization contains a biologic safety cabinet or a compounding aseptic containment isolator for compounding hazardous drugs. On the right of that room attached is an anteroom, which is ISO 7 positive pressure. Over on the right hand side of the slide, you have a setup where on the left hand side is a buffer room, which is ISO 7 and negative pressurized with a biologic safety cabinet and a compounding aseptic containment isolator for compounding hazardous drugs. Sandwiched in between is an anteroom, which is ISO 7 and positive pressurization. And on the right hand side of the anteroom is a buffer room, which again is ISO 7, but positive pressure with a laminar flow workbench or containment aseptic isolator. USP 800 outlines recommendations for the use of supplemental engineering controls. So let's dive into what some of those are. First off, some closed system transfer devices have been shown to limit potential for generating hazardous aerosolization during sterile compounding. However, there is no universal performance standard by which closed system transfer devices could be evaluated for its containment properties. The folks at NIOSH are working on developing a universal performance standard, however, that has not been finalized. Closed system transfer devices must not be used as a substitute for a CPEC when compounding hazardous drugs. Closed system transfer devices should be used when compounding hazardous drugs when the dosage form allows. Closed system transfer devices must be used when administering hazardous drugs when the dosage form allows. The USP 800 chapter provides recommendations for the use of environmental wipe studies for environmental quality and control. Environmental wipe studies for hazardous drugs should be performed routinely at least every six months. Surface wipe sampling should include first, the interior of the CPEC and the equipment contained in it. Second, staging or work areas near the CPEC or, and or a pass through. Third, areas adjacent to CPECs such as nearby flooring. Fourth, areas outside of a buffer room and patient administration areas. And it is noteworthy that currently no studies exist demonstrating the effectiveness of a specific number of wipe samples in determining the level of hazardous drug contamination. Let's do audience response question number four. According to USP chapter 800, which of the following personal protective equipment is required when compounding all sterile hazardous drugs? A two pair of chemotherapy gloves, B, a face shield, C, an N95 respirator, or D, isolation gowns. The correct answer to audience response question number four is A, two pair of chemotherapy gloves. Let's talk about personal protective equipment or PPE as outlined in the USP 800 chapter. PPE provides worker protection to reduce exposure to hazardous drugs, including aerosolization and drug residue. Chemotherapy rated gowns, gloves, head, 
hair and shoe covers are required for compounding sterile and non-sterile hazardous drugs. Chemotherapy-rated gloves and gowns are required when administered for injecting hazardous drugs for our nursing staff. Institutions must develop standard operating procedures for PPE based on the risk of exposure and the activities performed by staff members. Let's describe the role of gloves in handling hazardous drugs as outlined by the USP 800 chapter. Two pair of gloves are required for compounding and administering hazardous drugs. Use sterile gloves for the outer pair when compounding hazardous drugs into a sterile product. Gloves must meet the standards set forth by the American Society for Testing and Materials, or ASTM. Chemotherapy gloves must be powder free and inspect the gloves for defects before using them. Do not use defective gloves. Change gloves every 30 minutes, or if the gloves become torn, punctured, or contaminated. And hands must be washed with soap and water with each glove change. The use of gowns is required for handling hazardous drugs both with compounding procedures and administration of hazardous drugs per the USP 800 chapter. Gowns must be tested to resist permeability by hazardous drugs. So that means that these gowns have to have a polyethylene or a polypropylene coating or some other laminate material that maintains the integrity of the gown from permeation by a hazardous drug. Standard issue, Isolation gowns in a hospital do not have these types of coatings. Gowns must close in the back and have no seams or closures to allow hazardous drugs to pass through. Gowns should be changed per the manufacturer's recommendations or every two to three hours and after every incident of a spill or a splash. Gowns worn in hazardous drug handling areas must not be worn in other areas outside of the preparation area to avoid spreading of hazardous drug residue. Regular clothing that you wear to work, standard laboratory coats or scrubs can all retain hazardous drugs, so they are not recommended for use when compounding or handling hazardous drugs in any way. What does USP 800 have to say about some of the other PPE items that we use on a regular basis? Well, for head and hair covers, including beard and mustache covers, they're recommended. A second pair of shoe covers must be donned when compounding sterile hazardous drugs. So that means you, when you go into the buffer room to compound hazardous drugs, you apply your second pair of shoe covers. You do your work while you're compounding, and when you're getting ready to exit the buffer room, you remove that second pair of shoe cover. Eye and face protection must be used when the risk for spills or splashes is formidable. And the use of NIOSH certified N95 masks for respiratory protection is required for spill cleanup, any sort of routine cleaning activities, or any activity where there's the risk for potential airborne exposure. Following completion of the work of compounding hazardous drugs into a sterile product, we're going to remove our PPE and then we have to dispose of it somewhere. So what does the USP 800 chapter have to say about that? Well, first off, all PPE that is worn when handling hazardous drugs is considered to be contaminated with trace quantities of hazardous drugs. PPE must be placed in an appropriate waste container and disposed of per regulations. That includes federal regulations, that includes state regulations, and that includes your own institutional practices. PPE used during compounding should be disposed of in the proper container within the CSEC or IV room. Chemotherapy gloves must be discarded in an approved hazardous drug waste container. So you can have a small little container within your CPEC adjacent to your work tray or it can be disposed of in a sealable bag that's right outside of your CPEC.
to their credit, the USP 800 Writing Committee committed a lot of time to the development of parameters for staff education and training. This training must occur prior to employees independently handling hazardous drugs and needs to be reassessed at least annually. Some of the standards in which the training must cover includes an overview of the institution's list of hazardous drugs, which the institution can, can draft itself, or they can use the NIOSH list or some combination thereof. A review of the standard operating procedures related to the handling of hazardous drugs. The proper use of PPE and equipment and devices that are used in the handling of hazardous drugs. The spill management procedures that are drafted by the institution. The response to known or suspected hazardous drug exposure and the proper disposal of hazardous drugs. Now it's important to note that the USP 800 chapter has given institutions enough leeway where they can focus their training on their own institutional standards of practice. The USP 800 chapter gives us some guidance about what to do when we receive a container from a wholesaler that contains damaged components that are hazardous drugs. So there's a table here on this slide and I'll walk you through it. We'll start on the upper left-hand corner. So if you receive a shipping container that appears damaged, first off, you seal the container without opening and contact the supplier or wholesaler for instructions on what to do. If the unopened package is to be returned to the supplier, and close the package in an impervious container and label the outer container as hazardous. If the supplier does not want to accept this as a return, you dispose this properly in your institution as you would with any other hazardous drug per regulations. The second scenario is if a damaged shipping container has to be opened, you seal the container in a plastic or impervious container, and then you transport it to a CPEC in place on a preparation mat. You open the package in the CPEC and remove the unstable items and wipe the outside of the items with a disposable wipe. And you can repeat steps number two and three if you need to. And then when you're done with all that, you can deactivate, decontaminate, and clean the CPEC and discard the mat with cleaning agents as hazardous waste. The USP 800 chapter provides us with some practical standards as it relates to labeling, packaging, and transport of hazardous drugs. Let's start with labeling. It's pretty straightforward. All hazardous drugs must be labeled as such at all times during their transport. No exception to that. For packaging, compounding personnel must select and use packaging containers to maintain the physical integrity, stability, and sterility during transport. Packaging must protect from damage, leakage, contamination, and degradation of the hazardous drug product. For transport, hazardous drugs must be transported in containers that minimize the risk of breakage and or leakage. Pneumatic tubes must never be used to transport liquid or anti-neoplastic hazardous drugs. That sounds like common sense, but some institutions had done that prior to the standards being released. So hazardous drugs should never be placed in a pneumatic tube system. What does USP 800 have to say about hazardous drugs that are dispensed in a final dosage form. Hazardous drugs not requiring further manipulation other than counting or repackaging of the final dosage form may be prepared for dispensing without further requirements for contamination except the following circumstances. First, the manufacturer recommendations state otherwise. Second, there are visual indicators of hazardous drug exposure such as dust with capsules or some sort of leakage in a liquid dosage form. And third, you segregate equipment used for dispensing activities for any hazardous drugs.
Now we're going to transition into the recommendations made by USP 800 for compounding hazardous drugs. Institutions that are involved in compounding hazardous drugs must be compliant with USP Chapter 795 for non-sterile products and with Chapter USP 797 for sterile compounded products. Use a plastic-backed preparation mat on the work surface of a CPEC when compounding hazardous drugs and change it regularly during use and following any sort of spill. Clean equipment that's dedicated to compounding hazardous drugs or use equipment that is disposable. Bulk containers of liquid and API hazardous drugs must be handled in a CPEC to prevent worker exposure. The USP 800 chapter outlines a number of standards with respect to administration of hazardous drugs. Hazardous drugs must be administered safely by using protective medical devices and techniques. A specific technique that was called out in the chapter was priming IV tubing with a non-hazardous drug solution in a CPEC such that the nurses don't have to do it next to the bedside. Appropriate PPE must be worn when administering hazardous drugs and disposed of properly thereafter. Closed system transfer devices must be used for the administration of hazardous drugs when the dosage form allows. And avoid manipulating hazardous drug dosage forms. So that involves crushing tablets or opening capsules when possible. And if it is necessary, use appropriate PPE. What does USP 800 have to say about cleaning procedures? Well, it actually divides it up into four unique components, deactivation, decontamination, cleaning, and then lastly, disinfection. So all areas where hazardous drugs are handled routinely require deactivation, decontamination, and cleaning. And then the areas where sterile preparation occurs require an additional step of disinfection. Personnel in these activities must be trained in appropriate procedures for these four components of cleaning and wear appropriate PPE. Institutions must establish written procedures that outlines how they do this. These Procedures must be compliant also with USP Chapter 795 for non-sterile products and Chapter 797 for sterile product preparation. And lastly, cleaning agents must not be corrosive, toxic, volatile, or harmful to surface materials that are used with sterile compounding. Let's go through the USP 800 chapter's definitions of deactivation, decontamination, cleaning, and disinfection. They're outlined here on the slide in a table. So I'll start in the upper left-hand corner with deactivation. So the goal of deactivation is to render the compound inert or inactive, in this case, a hazardous drug. The agents that could be used are as listed in the hazardous drug labeling or with an EPA registered oxidizer, such as peroxide formulations or sodium hypochlorite. The goal of the decontamination step is to remove any hazardous drug residue. So the agents that could be considered require materials validated to be effective for hazardous drug decontamination or proven materials such as alcohol, water, peroxide, or sodium hypochlorite. The cleaning step essentially aims to remove organic or inorganic material from the area. And the agents that are typically chosen include germicidal detergents. And then lastly, the disinfection step, the goal is to destroy any residual microorganisms. So the use of an EPA registered disinfected and or sterile alcohol are appropriate for this type of disinfection. The USP 800 chapter has outlined some standards for spill control. 
So first off, personnel requires training about the proper use of the institutional spill kit. Standard operating procedures are required for spill prevention and for cleanup procedures, including the use of PPE and respirators. When a spill occurs, the circumstances surrounding that spill need to be documented. And then provide immediate medical evaluation to any potentially exposed personnel. Now, if you have family members or patients that are exposed to a hazardous drug because of a spill, those folks should report to a designated emergency department for evaluation instead of an employee health department. The USP 800 chapter requires a fair amount of documentation of the standard operating procedures that your institution has for handling hazardous drugs. So examples of those include a hazard communication program, an occupational safety program, how you handle the receipt, storage, compounding, dispensing, and administration of hazardous drugs, the use and maintenance of proper engineering controls, for example, CPECs and CSECs, how your institution lays out the use of PPE and proper hand hygiene based on the type of activity that's involved with handling hazardous drugs, the decontamination, deactivation, cleaning and disinfection processes that your institution has established, how you transport hazardous drugs around the institution, what sort of environmental monitoring that you do, if any, such as wipe samples in areas in which hazardous drugs are handled routinely, what are the procedures around spill control, and whether or not your institution chooses to do medical surveillance. The USP 800 chapter does not require medical surveillance among institutions in which handle hazardous drugs. However, they do make a fair number of recommendations that could be considered best practices if the institution chooses to do medical surveillance. So some of those are as follows. First off, a baseline assessment of the worker's health and medical history. An estimate of the worker's hazardous drug exposure over time. Monitoring of end organ function at risk for toxicity from hazardous drug exposure and follow-up plans for acute and long-term exposures to hazardous drugs. The USP Chapter 797 for sterile product preparation was revised, and the revised chapter was published on June 1, 2019. However, enforcement of that chapter is currently postponed. So the first USP 797 chapter is still in force. The changes that are notable is first off, the removal of the content of hazardous drug handling from USP 797, all that is now in USP 800, and also the removal of content with respect to radio pharmaceuticals, all of which is being covered in USP chapter 825. There is an exquisite amount of detail of the revised USP 797 chapter in the handout. Now, the reason why the enforcement of the chapter is currently postponed is there was an appeal that was filed that was granted for the review of the beyond use dating criteria that was changed from the original version of the USP 797 back in March of last year. So none of the changes that were in the revised USP 79 chapter are finalized yet. Uh, it could happen at any time. However, as of the recording of this slide deck, the original USP 797 chapter is in force and I would expect that that would be the information that's going to be on the upcoming exam. The content in the USP 797 chapter is considered fair game for the exam. So what are some of the basic requirements in the chapter? First off, there is a listing of the engineering controls required for sterile product compounding. 
cleaning procedures are outlined just as they are in USP 797. Beyond use dating criteria are, are outlined. Documentation requirements are specified. Quality control measures are outlined. And then there's a chapter which really doesn't apply to us on allergenic extracts. There are additional changes that have been made to the revised USP 797 chapter. The risk levels for beyond use dating criteria have been eliminated. The time frame for immediate use compounded sterile products has been redefined. Similar to the USP 800 chapter, there is a need for a designated person to oversee compounding activities. Staff that handle compounded sterile products require testing for their sterile technique on a more frequent basis. And then lastly, documentation requirements are more explicit. The following are the changes to the criteria for immediate use in the revised USP 797 chapter. When preparing a compounded sterile product, aseptic technique is required. Staff must follow evidence-based practices for physical and chemical compatibility of the drug, such as following the FDA label of the drug. Single dose containers must not be used for more than one patient. So that is regardless of whether or not you are using a closed system transfer device. Each single dose container is earmarked for a single patient preparation. Administration of the drug has to begin within four hours of the start of the compounding of the drug. And then no more than three unique sterile products must be admixed together in order for a drug to be considered for immediate use. The revised USP 797 chapter outlines some of the standards for certification for a program that compounds sterile products. They include airflow testing, HEPA filter integrity testing, an assessment of total particle counts in the air, dynamic airflow smoke pattern testing for PECs, and then an assessment of microbiologic contamination of both the air and surface monitoring. The revised USP 797 chapter has new microbial risk levels with respect to beyond use dating. So the first categorization is in the table on the left-hand side. It's called category one. So this is a compounded sterile product that is assigned a beyond use date of 12 hours or less at controlled room temperature or 24 hours or less if the product has to be refrigerated. So this applies to products that are prepared in a segregated compounding area for non-hazardous compounded sterile products or prepared in a containment segregated compounding area for hazardous compounded sterile products. In the right-hand column, category two compounded sterile products are those that are assigned a beyond use dating criteria of greater than 12 hours at room temperature or greater than 24 hours for refrigerated products. These compounded sterile products are prepared in a clean room suite. And this includes an ante room and a buffer room, rooms that are classified as either ISO 7 or 8 for an ante room or ISO 7 for a buffer room. Audience response question number five. The ASCO standards for safe handling of hazardous drugs call for more research to inform a recommended practice standard for which of the following areas? A, the need for negative pressure rooms when compounding hazardous drugs. B, the use of double gloving with the outer sterile glove when compounding sterile hazardous drugs. C, the generation of an institutional hazardous drug list, or D, the use of closed system transfer devices. The correct answer for audience response question number five 
is D, the use of closed system transfer devices. It's important to recognize that a number of different professional organizations in hematology, oncology have proposed their own standards for safe handling of hazardous drugs. An important distinction is that we as practitioners and in unique institutions are going to be held accountable for following the USP 800 standards, not some of these standards from other professional organizations. So when we're crafting our own institutional standards of practice, we should always have the USP 797 and 800 standards in mind when doing that. But nonetheless, it's important to know what these other organizations are stating because they do bring forth to light some interesting topics and recommend some good practices that we should consider. So I'm going to start off by highlighting some of the recommendations from the American Society of Clinical Oncology and their standards for safe handling of hazardous drugs. So their first standard, they come out and they endorse the existing standards for safe handling of hazardous drugs by OSHA, the USP 800 chapter. NIOSH, and the Oncology Nursing Society. Their second standard, they speak about medical surveillance. And they state that institutions should have policies or procedures to monitor hazardous drug contamination in the settings in which they are used for staff that are involved in potential acute exposure, such as a spill. However, they note that there's a lack of data at present to support baseline screening and surveillance for all staff that handle hazardous drugs. Continuing on with the ASCO standards for safe handling of hazardous drugs, their third standard focuses on closed system transfer devices and the need to develop a standardized testing protocol in order to identify and certify effective closed system transfer devices. This is important because there's a number of different uh, entries on the market now for closed system transfer devices. There's a lot of marketing that is taking place between these different products. And I'm sure each of you at your institutions is being inundated by representatives from these, these individual companies telling you why their closed system transfer device is of particular benefit compared to others on the market. But we just don't have a standard testing protocol in order to make a, a fair judgment about that at present. Their fourth standard talks about external ventilation of a CPEC. So it makes common sense that if you ventilate a CPEC to the outside of the facility, that that's going to reduce the staff exposure to hazardous drugs. However, what we don't know is what the long-term data is to quantify the level of protection afforded by that intervention of external ventilation. So that type of data needs to be generated. The fifth standard focuses on developing alternative work options for staff that are trying to conceive or potentially are pregnant or breastfeeding who handle hazardous drugs. Just over a year ago, the Oncology Nursing Society and the Hematology Oncology Pharmacist Association issued a joint statement on the safe handling of hazardous drugs. Their first point was to establish evidence-based practices for the safe handling of hazardous drugs, and foundational to doing that was to promote the appropriate use of PPE and engineering controls. They also support the application of supplemental engineering controls, such as closed system transfer devices, for both compounding and administration of hazardous drugs. They advocate for the education and training for safe handling of hazardous drugs of all staff members that will be handling them. They are promoting alternative duty standards for staff members that could be pregnant or breastfeeding. And then they establish that patient and family education for alternative setting administration of hazardous drugs is important, such as in the home setting for oral oncolytic drugs. Continuing on with the standards that have been uh, promulgated by the Oncology Nursing Society and the Hematology Oncology Pharmacist Association for the handling of hazardous drugs, 
They state that hazardous drug disposal should continue according to regulatory guidelines. They recommend that surface wipe testing for environmental surveillance and quality improvement for handling of hazardous drugs be conducted. Now, that was not a requirement of USP 800, but uh, the ONS HOPA guidelines come out and strongly recommend it. They also recommend that institutions should engage in medical surveillance for staff members, which again was a recommendation from USP 800, not a requirement. Something new that they promote is that professional societies should support research for hazardous drug handling and evidence-based practices for mitigating risk with respect to handling hazardous drugs. And then lastly, that professional societies should support compliance with NIOSH, USP, and all other regulatory standards and promote these standards into enforceable law, such as being adopted by state boards of pharmacy. Audience response question number six. Which of the following FDA approved agents can now be discarded as non-hazardous waste as a result of the hazardous waste pharmaceutical amendment to RICRA? A, warfarin, B, cyclophosphamide, C, nicotine patches, or D, melphalan? The correct answer to audience response question number six is C, nicotine patches. We are going to transition into some of the standards as it relates to hazardous drug waste. So the federal law, which outlines hazardous drug waste and disposal, is called the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA. It is administered by the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. And some of the definitions that are outlined in this federal statute include the following. Characteristic waste. So that is waste that is ignitable, corrosive, reactive, or toxic. Some pharmaceuticals that are prepared in alcohol bases, which may result in their classification as hazardous, are included in this. Then there are the types of facilities that generate waste. And then the designation of each individual facility is based on how much waste they generate. So for example, there are large quantity generators. So these are places that generate lots and lots of waste. So greater than a thousand kilograms of hazardous waste or greater than one kilogram of acute hazardous waste, which is defined as P-listed waste, which I will get to shortly or other types of waste that could potentially in contaminate soil, water, things like that. And there are small quantity generators. Those are facilities that generate more than 100 kilograms, but less than 1,000 kilograms of hazardous waste. And then lastly, there are conditionally exempt small quantity generators. And these are facilities that generate less than 100 kilos of hazardous waste or less than or equal to a gram, a kilogram of acute hazardous waste. Some additional RICRA definitions as it relates to the disposal of chemotherapy include bulk hazardous drug waste. So that includes hazardous waste whose contents contain more than 3% of the capacity of the container. Those are things such as chemotherapy vials that uh, could be potentially partially full, syringes or other materials used to clean a preparation area in which hazardous drugs are prepared. Then there's trace contaminated waste. So that includes things that contain a minimal amount of drug, less than 3% of the total capacity. So that could include gloves, gowns, gauze, masks. These are things that can be incinerated at a medical waste facility. And then lastly, sharps, which include needles, ampules, and syringes. The RICRA federal standards for governing hazardous waste disposal have two general categories of agents as it applies 
to pharmaceuticals. First is called P-listed waste, and the second is called U-listed waste. So P-listed waste and U-listed waste are defined as unused commercial chemicals that are being disposed of. The main difference between P and U-listed waste is their level of risks. U-listed waste are considered toxic, but not quite as toxic as P-listed waste. P-listed waste have acute hazardous effects that occur in smaller quantities in a shorter period of time. So as you can see in the table on the left-handed side, I have a number of drugs which are listed as P-listed waste. So this includes a number of agents that are used with regularity, such as in our world, arsenic trioxide for acute promyelocytic leukemia, epinephrine, nicotine, nitroglycerine, phentyramine, physostigmine, and warfarin. There are a number of agents that are listed as U-listed waste. I will not list them all to you other than to highlight some of the ones that we have some regularity with, with respect to interaction, uh, chlorambucil, cyclophosphamide, donorubicin, mitomycin C, melflan. One of the longstanding criticisms of the RICRA federal standards governing hazardous waste disposal is they're not really targeted for pharmaceuticals. It's more of an all-encompassing toxic waste series of regulations, and there are a number of uh, square pegs for round holes as it relates to drugs being disposed of. So the EPA set out to remedy that, and they did a number of years of work to try and get there, and a new federal standard was published in April of 29, which helped to move us a little bit farther on down the road. It creates regulation to better fit the healthcare industry. It eliminates the intentional sewering of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals, which brings up hazardous uh, exposure to the global environment. It clarifies the role of reverse distributors in hazardous pharmaceutical waste. And it also removes regulation of FDA approved nicotine replacement therapies to be listed as hazardous wastes. The new EPA standards for pharmaceutical waste draws the distinction between reverse distributors and reverse logistics. And this table tries to outline some of those distinctions. Over on the left-hand side for reverse distribution, these are prescription pharmaceuticals for which no redistribution can occur. These prescription pharmaceuticals are sent to reverse distributors and they're considered as solid waste at the healthcare facility. The actual part of the law, part 266 subpart P, this last section has to deal with when this will become active and adopted by the individual states. On the right-hand side, the reverse logistics, this deals with non-prescription pharmaceuticals. So non-prescription pharmaceuticals and other unsold retail items that go back to reverse logistics are not considered solid waste. And for this section, part 266, this is considered to be effective immediately for federal use and individual states will adopt as they see fit. Audience response question number seven. Which of the following is not addressed in the ASCO ONS safety standards? A. Guidelines for the preparation and handling of hazardous drugs. B, adjudication of verbal orders for chemotherapy regimens. C, policy requirements for preparation of intrathecal chemotherapy. Or D, tracking of cumulative doses of chemotherapy drugs with significant end organ toxicity. The correct answer for audience response question number seven is A, guidelines for preparation and handling of hazardous drugs. In the mid-2000s, the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the Oncology Nursing Society decided to collaborate to develop chemotherapy administration safety standards. The first iteration of this was published in 2008 
It was updated in 2013 and updated a second time in 2016. And the goal of this was to establish safety standards for the administration of safe chemotherapy to adult and pediatric patients in the outpatient treatment setting. Select safety standards are evaluated as part of the Quality Oncology Practice Initiative or QOPI certification process. Of note, these standards do not mandate a pharmacist check in the dispensing of antineoplastic drugs or in the clinical evaluation of the dispensing of antineoplastic drugs. The ASCO ONS safety guidelines are divided up into several domains, the first of which is presented on this slide. Domain number one creates a safe environment and speaks to specific staffing and general policies to be followed by the practice. So some of the standards include the credentialing and education for all staff members based on their level of practice, baseline requirements for starting a new chemotherapy treatment plan, patient assessment at each clinical encounter, when it's appropriate for referrals for psychosocial, financial, or other needs, updating patient medication lists, policy mandates and processes for pediatric patients that account for legal requirements, access to a 24-7 triage and emergency service, safe handoff policies, and a process for reporting and documenting adverse events and near misses. The second domain of the ASCO ONS safety standards focuses on treatment planning, patient consent, and patient education. The goal of this is to develop standard processes for obtaining informed consent for treatment, and provision of patient education in a verbal, written, and or electronic format. Some of the elements of education that are identified are, first, drug names including supportive care medications, information to be provided to patients on drug-drug and drug-food interactions, the plan for a potential missed dose, long-term and short-term toxicities of the treatment, adverse events that require contacting a provider, events that require discontinuing home medications, procedures for safe handling of medications at home, particularly oral oncolytics, and the plan for follow-up visits. The third domain of the ASCO ONS safety standards focuses on the ordering, preparation, dispensing, and administration of chemotherapy. Some of the points identified include the identification of standard treatment regimens, a process by which chemotherapy regimens that vary from a standard practice or protocol are identified and that there's a rationale for exception orders. All research protocols will receive an IRB review ahead of patient enrollment. There's no verbal orders for chemotherapy except to hold or stop chemotherapy. There is a use of standardized paper or electronic chemotherapy orders at the regimen level. That parenteral and oral chemotherapy orders are specified accordingly. There are competencies for staff that admix chemotherapy. Note that it doesn't say anything about licensure for pharmacy technicians and or pharmacists. That there's independent verification of chemotherapy orders by credentialed staff. Note that it doesn't say anything about a licensed pharmacist. That there's independent verification of admixed chemotherapy products by credentialed staff. Note that it doesn't say anything about a licensed pharmacist. Labeling requirements for parenteral and intrathecal chemotherapy, including a comprehensive policy on how that is handled. A policy for vinca alkaloid administration by intravenous infusion. Standards for off-site chemotherapy preparation, if that's applicable. And lastly, administration of chemotherapy by qualified staff.
Domain number four of the ASCO ONS safety standards focuses on monitoring following the administration of chemotherapy. Some of the highlights of this domain include utilization of standard monitoring parameters for each treatment regimen, the development of a policy for emergent treatment of patients based on best evidence when chemotherapy complications occur, availability of appropriate antidotes and emergency medications on site in the infusion treatment area, the development of a plan for adherence assessment in patients with prescribed oral chemotherapy, including toxicity monitoring for each clinical encounter, documentation of dose modifications in the treatment regimens due to prior toxicity, and lastly, cumulative doses of chemotherapy agents are tracked. Audience response question number eight. Which of the following is most correct regarding core measures assessed by QOPI, or the Quality Oncology Practice Initiative? A, on-site reviewers from ASCO will abstract chart data for compliance. B, reported core measures are the sole criteria for QOPI certification. C, Core measures are required for each malignancy that has treatment guidelines written by NCCN. D, institutions are required to self-report compliance with core measures to ASCO ahead of an on-site visit. The correct answer for audience response question number eight is D, Institutions are required to self-report compliance with core measures to ASCO ahead of an on-site visit. The Quality Oncology Practice Initiative, or QOPI, is a quality benchmarking tool developed by the American Society of Clinical Oncology for adult outpatient oncology practices. There are two components in order to achieve certification. First, sites must submit abstracted medical record information to be evaluated against standard practice requirements, which are referred to as core certification measures. Second, ASCO ONS safety standards are assessed by a surveyor during an on-site certification evaluation. As was mentioned in the previous slide, the QOPI certification measures are a required component of the process of applying to become a QOPI designated practice. What I've done in these next couple of slides is to break down these certification measures into like groupings in a table format. So we're going to start on this slide over on the left hand side, the general core measures that are required when abstracting charts and sending the data in to ASCO for review are as follows. First, the pathology of the malignancy needs to be documented. There needs to be confirmation of the staging of the cancer. The treatment intent for each patient, meaning cure versus palliation, needs to be documented. There needs to be an informed consent for treatment documented. There needs to be an unambiguous chemotherapy treatment plan. There needs to be a patient performance status assessment. There needs to be a plan for pain management. The patient's emotional well-being needs to be assessed. There needs to be advanced directives on the chart for each patient. There's a requirement for documentation of height, weight, and body surface area. There needs to be a plan for monitoring oral chemotherapy treatment. And there needs to be a treatment summary for patients that have completed their therapy. Now the next grouping for certification measures is symptom or toxicity management. And some of the components of that include Appropriate anti-emetic prophylaxis for either moderately or highly emetogenic chemotherapy. Discussion of infertility risk with chemotherapy for patients of childbearing age. 
For end of life measures, this includes regular pain assessments at the end of life and documentation of a plan for end of life and the overall plan of care. There needs to be an assessment of dyspnea at the end of life. And when appropriate, there needs to be a referral to palliative care services. Continuing on with COPE certification measures, we'll start on the left-hand side of the table with breast cancer. For patients that have stage one, two, or three, estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor negative breast cancer should be offered combination chemotherapy within four months of surgery. There should be standardized testing for HER2 new positivity. Trastuzumab should be offered to patients that have HER2 new positive disease. Tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor should be offered to patients with stage one, two, or three estrogen receptor progesterone receptor positive disease. Bone modifying agents such as zoledronic acid or denosumab should be offered for patients that have documented bone metastases. Let's move in the middle column and talk about colorectal cancer. A family history should be obtained and genetic testing should be performed when appropriate. CEA monitoring should take place post-surgery. Adjuvant chemotherapy should be offered to patients with stage 3 disease. Adjuvant chemotherapy should be offered for patients with stage 2 or stage 3 rectal cancer. A colonoscopy should be performed within 6 months of surgery and or chemotherapy completion. KRAS testing should be performed for patients receiving or planning to receive cetuximab and panitumumab. Anti-EGFR therapy should be avoided in patients that have a KRAS mutation. Let's move on the right-hand side of the table now to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. There should be documentation of a CD20 antigen expression in patients receiving obinutuzumab, ofatumumab, or rituximab. Patients should be tested for hepatitis B who are to receive anti-CD20 therapy. There should be monitoring for the usage of PET scans in patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Let's continue with the Quopi certification measures. We'll start on the left-hand side of the table non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. Adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy should be offered for patients with stage 1A, 2, or 3A non-small cell lung cancer. Performance status should be documented in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Molecular testing should be conducted in patients with stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer. Concurrent chemo radiotherapy should be offered to patients with stage 3B non-small cell lung cancer. The use of prophylactic cranial irradiation should be offered to patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer. Overtreatment for patients with small cell lung cancer with platinum-based chemotherapy in those unlikely to respond should be avoided. Use of early thoracic radiotherapy for patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer should be offered. Let's move to the middle column for gynecologic oncology. An operative report documenting residual disease should be available within 48 hours after surgery for ovarian cancer. Complete postoperative staging should also be widely disseminated in the medical record. Chemotherapy should be offered within six weeks of postoperative procedures for patients with ovarian cancer. VTE prophylaxis should be offered postoperatively, postoperatively for patients with ovarian cancer surgery. 
The timing of preoperative antibiotics should be documented. And discontinuation of antibiotics following gynecologic oncology surgery should be done at 24 hours postoperatively. Let's move over to the right-hand column with prostate cancer. There should not be an overuse of PET scans or other imaging studies in patients at low risk for recurrence. The use of bone density testing in patients receiving androgen deprivation therapy should be undertaken. Pain management should be assessed in patients with bone metastasis. Patients receiving abiraterone should be monitored routinely for toxicity. Patients who receive external beam radiation therapy should be offered adjuvant hormonal therapy. Audience response question number nine. Which of the following are quality metrics that oncology practices participating in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Oncology Practice Model, or OCM, are required to submit to CMS? A, appropriateness of prescribing erythroid colony stimulating factors. B, percentage of patients that utilize the emergency room during cancer treatment. C, number of patients that a practice enrolls in NCI-sponsored phase three trials, or D, patient compliance with oral oncolytic therapy. The correct answer to audience response question number nine is B, the percentage of patients that utilize the emergency room during cancer treatment. For the last decade, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, has been attempting to try and tie payment for care provided to the quality of care provided and not to the quantity of care provided. For a number of reasons, this has been an elusive goal in the oncology world. And it wasn't until 2015 until CMS was able to really dip its toe in the water with the development of something called the Oncology Care Model, or OCM. There's a component of CMS called the Innovation Center, which helps to develop these novel payment mechanisms which recognize value of care as opposed to quantity of care. And they were the ones that helped push this across the goal line with a trial in 2015. The OCM focuses on episodes of care, specifically chemotherapy, and the overarching goals of the OCM are for the improvement in care coordination, to ensure that all the care that's delivered is appropriate, and to ensure equitable access for Medicare beneficiaries for all chemotherapy treatments. Now that we know what OCM aims to accomplish, how does it work? Well, primarily it is an episode-based payment model, which targets chemotherapy and related ancillary care in six-month blocks following the initiation of treatment for an individual patient. The goal is to emphasize practice transformation, so physician practices report on quality metrics back to CMS for CMS to evaluate. There's a multi-payer model, so this includes Medicare fee-for-service and other payers, which encompasses Medicare's Part B for intravenous therapy and Part D for oral therapy. What are the requirements for an oncology practice to participate in the OCM? Well, the criteria include having 24-hour, seven-day-a-week access to an oncology provider, and that provider has to have access to the patient's medical records at all times. The oncology certified electronic medical record that is utilized has to have achieved meaningful use stage two compliance by the end of the third year of participation. The utilization of data for continuous quality improvement 
involves the data being reported to CMS and then the C and then CMS providing rapid cycle feedback back to the practices. So there's a cycle of continuous quality improvement. Additional requirements for OCM participation include the practice providing core functions of patient navigation. There needs to be documentation of a care plan for every patient that contains 13 components of the Institute of Medicine's care management plan. What's in that? Things like, what are the overarching treatment goals? Is there a multidisciplinary care team and do they provide documentation of their services? Is there robust psychosocial support? And does the practice provide estimated out-of-pocket costs for the different procedures that are offered to the patient? And with respect to the treatment delineation, patients are required to be treated with therapies that are consistent with nationally recognized clinical guidelines. So that can include things like NCCN or ASCO guidelines. The way that the OCM pays practices is, number one, they don't change any of the standard payment procedures for seeing patients in the office, providing infusion services, the charges for the chemotherapy drugs. All of those charges go through as they normally would. However, there is an additional per beneficiary per month payment, or PBPM, which is $160 per month for each six month treatment episode. And there's a performance-based payment. So there's incentive for gain share for lowering the total cost of care for a six month treatment episode. CMS is going to benchmark payments and compare practices against each other. And the risk arrangement for gain share may be one-sided or two-sided. I had mentioned that in order to participate in the OCM, that oncology practices have to report out quality measures to CMS. So this table outlines what some of those quality measures are. So we'll start in the upper left-hand corner of the table. And the two main quality domains are first, communication and care coordination. And the second quality domain is the patient caregiver experience. So the first practice requirement for reporting under the domain of communication and care coordination is the number of emergency department visits per beneficiary per episode of treatment. The second quality indicator that has to be reported is the number of hospital admissions per episode of treatment. The third practice requirement for reporting is the number of patients admitted to hospice less than three days before death. The next practice requirement for reporting is the total number of emergency department visits for a patient in the last 30 days of life. All four of those reporting requirements come from claims data. Now for the patient and caregiver experience metrics that need to be required, first, is the documentation of a care plan for pain management, including a pain score. That will be reported out by the practice. Second, the score on patient experience surveys. And there's typically a CMS contractor that manages those survey results. And then last, psychosocial screening or interventions as a result of psychosocial screening. And those again are reported by the practice. I'm going to transition from quality metrics to some of the issues as it relates to informatics in oncology. And so this slide is a diagram that's an overview of some of the components of an oncology electronic medical record. So you have the overarching electronic medical record, and then it's made up of three central components in the world of oncology. Over on the left-hand side, you have the re results reporting information system. So 
These are things like your ability to report out labs, your ability to report out pathology reports, your ability to report out imaging studies, things like that. In the middle, you have the computerized physician order entry. Now, for oncology practices, it's a little bit more complicated than just ordering a dose of furosemide. And the reason for that is the repeated cycles that chemotherapy regimens have and the dose modifications that chemotherapy regimens have, the layered on supportive care that chemotherapy regimens have. So the computerized order entry for physicians tends to be very difficult to navigate in terms of building an electronic medical record. And then lastly, over on the right-hand side, you have your clinical decision support system. So these are things that point out drug-drug interactions, uh, abnormal labs, things like that. But in the world of oncology, this can often be difficult as well, because if you're going to build a decision support system for dosing in oncology, okay, well, what about standard doses of Cytera being at 100 milligram per meter squared or 200 milligram per meter squared per day? And then you have high dose Cytera being at two grams per meter squared or three grams per meter squared per dose given every 12 hours. Uh, same thing for methotrexate. You have doses that can range from a couple hundred milligram per meter squared all the way up to 12 to 15 grams per meter squared. And that's not even to take into consideration some of the issues as it relates to pediatrics. So the clinical decision support systems are exceedingly complicated to pull off in electronic medical records for oncology. For all the reasons that were described on the previous slide, chemotherapy order set creation is a cumbersome business. And so this algorithm provides a little bit of guidance on how to do that. So not surprisingly, it really serves the interest of this process well to have an interdisciplinary team. So that typically involves having a medical oncologist as a lead, having a number of sophisticated oncology nurses, oncology research nurses, oncology pharmacists, investigational drug pharmacists who collaborate together to ensure that the order sets are correct. Step two is that this group has to create a paper trail when devising each of the individual chemotherapy regimens that the Institute is gonna build in its electronic medical record. So for every single regimen, you need to have a paper order set that's created that includes things like IV fluids, antiemetics, additional supportive care, laboratory orders, imaging studies if necessary, each of the individual chemotherapy drugs, the dose, the route of administration, infusion parameters if necessary, how often it's given, how many days it's given, all that needs to be spelled out very precisely on the order sets. And then that component is then taken by the folks in the informatics department and built into the electronic medical record. However, just having that built into the electronic medical record is not enough. You need to have what is built into the electronic medical record validated for correctness. Because usually the folks that are actually doing the building of the individual regimens in the electronic medical record are not clinicians and they're certainly not likely to be oncology clinicians. So there needs to be oncology professionals, whether it's a medical oncologist, an oncology nurse, an oncology pharmacist, or some combination thereof that reviews the actual build into the electronic medical record to make sure nothing was built incorrectly or that some critical component was not neglected. A technology that has been making headway into pharmacy practice for dispensing of hazardous drugs 
is what is referred to as admixture verification technology, or another way that it's commonly referred to as IV workflow management. And the idea behind this is to use several integrated technologies to improve the accuracy of compounded sterile products that otherwise may get missed in just a manual check. So some of the technologies that are used are barcode technologies to pull the barcode off of the individual vials that are being used to prepare a particular sterile product, digital imaging technology to take pictures of each of the vials that are used to compound a particular product, and then the syringes that were, that were used and how much drug has been withdrawn into the syringe. And then lastly, when you have the final product compounded, you can use technologies to assess the volumetric component of the product and then the gravimetric component of the product to optimize the chance that the product was compounded 100% correctly. This slide represents an experience at an academic medical center that implemented an IV workflow management system that assesses both volumetric and gravimetric verification. And they did so with a handful of chemotherapy drugs, which included paclitaxel, docetaxel, pemetrexid, and oxaliplatin. So several of these drugs are a little bit cumbersome to admix. Let's look at the table. We'll start on the left-hand side with technician preparation time prior to the implementation of the workflow management system. The average technician prep time per dose was approximately 450 seconds. 14 days following implementation of the IV workflow management system, that time increased to 495 seconds per dose. And then when they looked out 90 days following the implementation, the time dropped back down to 433 seconds per dose. When you evaluate the pharmacist's check time, Prior to implementation, each dose required 46 seconds. 14 days following the implementation, that increased to 61.5 seconds. And then 90 days following implementation, the time dropped down to 20 seconds per dose. Audience response question number 10. Which of the following characteristics of oncology clinical pathways is being advocated by national professional oncology societies? A, oncology pathways should include issues beyond drug treatment regimens, such as survivorship and end-of-life care. B, pathway compliance should approximate 100% with well-written pathways. C, commercial entities such as drug wholesalers should not draft or support oncology clinical pathways, or D, diversity and variation in application of clinical pathways supports physician autonomy in therapeutic decision-making. The correct answer for audience response question number 10 is A, oncology pathways should include issues beyond drug treatment regimens such as survivorship and end-of-life care. I'm gonna to briefly touch on the use of oncology clinical pathways. So ASCO has produced a policy statement addressing the widespread growth of oncology clinical pathways. And what they said is, first off, there needs to be a national approach for standardization of oncology pathways. And there needs to be consistency in how these pathways are developed. And beyond just treatment regimens, there should be pathways that support diagnostic decision-making, surgery, radiation, and other medical treatments beyond just chemotherapy. The utilization of best medical evidence with routine updates should be a core part of any pathway that's, that's being utilized widely. And there needs to be an effort to preserve physician autonomy and recognize interpatient variability.
Additional points that the ASCO policy statement on oncology clinical pathways made include promoting administrative efficiency, not only for providers, but also for payers, promoting education, research, and ready access to clinical trials for patients, a certification process for different clinical pathway programs that are being utilized. And then lastly, supportive research to discern pathway impact on patient care and clinical outcomes. Audience response question number 11. Which of the following is most correct regarding the difference between the FDA approval process for generic drugs and biosimilars? Choice A, the biosimilar pathway involves drugs with a wide range of molecular weights. Choice B, the endpoint for approval for generic drugs and biosimilars is plus minus 20% bioavailability. Choice C, biosimilars are generated in the lab from reproducible steps of chemical synthesis. In choice D, biosimilars must demonstrate similar safety, purity, and potency. The correct answer for audience response question number 11 is choice D, biosimilars must demonstrate similar safety, purity, and potency. Let's briefly touch on biosimilars by starting with the definition of what a biosimilar is. It's a biotechnologic product comparable to an already FDA-approved biotechnologic product in terms of quality, safety, and efficacy. The FDA requires that the biosimilar drug is highly similar to the existing reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components. And the absence of clinically meaningful differences between the biosimilar product and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency. For this slide, I've adapted a table that was from a paper that our colleague, Dr. Donald Harvey, wrote a few years back on biosimilars to distinguish the differences between biosimilars and generic drugs. So we'll start on the left-hand side of the table up on the top. For the molecular composition for a biosimilar, it has a high molecular weight and it's a complex biologic agent. Whereas for a generic drug, it's a small molecular weight, generally speaking, and has a reproducible structure. Back over to the left-hand side, comparison with a reference drug. For a biosimilar, it has the same amino acid sequence it may have different post-translational modifications, protein folding, or excipients. For a generic drug, it has the identical active ingredient in the same bioequivalence impurity. With respect to manufacturing, the biosimilar uses living cellular systems, has unique cell lines and production steps, whereas the generic drug is chemically synthesized and has a stepwise process of identified chemical reactions. And wrapping up with the FDA approval process, the biosimilar has a biologics license application and has to demonstrate similar safety, purity, potency, and safety. Whereas for a generic drug, it simply has to demonstrate bioequivalence. ASCO crafted a policy statement on biosimilars a few years back, so let's describe some of the highlights of that. They state that clinical trials demonstrating sufficiently similar safety, efficacy, and immunogenicity in biosimilars are necessary. They also state that the FDA should be given substantial discretion in forging the regulatory pathway for approval of individual classes of biosimilar products, but that process should be transparent. In any instance in which the FDA decides that clinical trials are not necessary for follow-on products, the agency should publicly disclose that decision and provide a detailed rationale as to why they made that decision. Continuing on with the ASCO policy statement on biosimilars, 
Not surprisingly, ASCO came out pretty hard against any system being adopted that would limit physician choice among biosimilar products or require substitution of products that would be designated as interchangeable. They state that in every instance, the physician should decide which among similar products should be prescribed for an individual patient. Biosimilar products should be subject to initial review and oversight and post-approval by the office to which the original innovator product is assigned rather than a separate, quote, generics office. Every biosimilar product should be subject to meaningful post-marketing safety surveillance. And interchangeability should be determined only through clinical trials adequate to support substitution of the biosimilar product for the innovator product without sacrificing safety or efficacy. Finishing up with the ASCO policy statement on biosimilars, Non-patent data exclusivity should be adequate to ensure continued innovation both in new products and in new indications for existing products. Additional years of exclusivity should be provided as an incentive for the development of new indications. Legislators should extend pediatric exclusivity incentives. And Congress should ensure that the FDA is provided adequate resources to meet the new demands. There's going to be a number of new agents where bioequivalence is going to be assessed for these biosimilar products, which will increase the workload for the FDA. Audience response question number 12. Which of the following is most characteristic of a drug that would be dispensed by a specialty pharmacy? A, drugs with multiple cytochrome P450 mediated drug interactions. B, agents with a high likelihood of profound myelosuppression. C, any oral agents approved for the treatment of cancer, or D, agents with specific handling, storage, and delivery requirements. The correct answer to audience response question number 12 is D, agents with specific handling, storage, and delivery requirements. So what are some of those characteristics of specialty pharmacy drugs? Well, these tend to be high cost medications. They tend to be part of a complex treatment regimen. They often have special handling requirements. The drugs may be part of a limited or exclusive distribution network. Think the IMIDs for multiple myeloma. They may be medications that are available to treat just rare diseases. Or they could be medications that are defined by payers as specialty pharmaceuticals. Let's discuss some of the nuts and bolts of the fulfillment component of specialty pharmacy. So it involves a significant amount of coordination of care and facilitating drug access. Oftentimes you have to coordinate mail order delivery logistics. There's negotiation of pair contracts, maintaining cold chain distribution, dispensing and tracking REMS drugs, making sure your accounts receivable support and management is flowing well, and pursuing national accreditation for your program. Regarding the technical and clinical patient care support aspects of specialty pharmacy, there needs to be a dedicated team for benefits investigation to do prior authorizations and help patients with patient assistance programs from the manufacturer. There needs to be a call center for patient questions when they have them. Likely gonna need a case management program for specific disease state management that you're involved with with your pharmacy. There needs to be product training for not only the technicians, but also the pharmacists for new agents that come out. And then data management of the technical and clinical patient care services so metrics can be developed to assess workload. For the last topic that I'm gonna address in this presentation, we're gonna have a shout out to our oncology pharmacy technician colleagues. 
Two years ago, ASHP and HOPA partnered on a paper to outline the roles and responsibilities of oncology pharmacy technicians. So let's describe some of those. They start out by saying that pharmacy technicians should seek out credentialing via the pharmacy technician certification exam. With respect to medication compounding, dispensing, and distribution, oncology pharmacy technicians are well suited to promote compliance in daily workflow with USP Chapter 797 and USP Chapter 800. With respect to patient care services, pharmacy technicians are very well qualified to conduct medication histories, to conduct adherence monitoring for oral oncolytics, to promote REMS compliance, and to do record keeping for investigational drug services. With respect to revenue cycle optimization, Pharmacy technicians are well-skilled at obtaining prior authorizations, validating individual drug claims, working drug denials from insurance companies, assessing inventory, managing drug replacement programs, and minimizing the amount of drug waste in the pharmacy. Additional skills that our pharmacy technicians bring to the table for supply chain management include the oversight of drug purchasing, procurement, inventory control, and management of drug shortages. For technology and informatics, they often serve as a liaison between the clinical and informatics teams. They oversee the automation and technology systems that we use in the pharmacy department. They participate in the IT policy development and governance. They're involved with customer service. They can assess charge integrity. They participate in the development and the management of databases. They assess the new technology that are, is being presented to the pharmacy department for consideration of adoption. They're involved with workflow management, such as IV workflow technology. And they participate in education and training, not only amongst their technician peers, but also for the rest of the pharmacy department. With respect to quality improvement, they're involved with environmental monitoring, include, including that with sterile product preparation. They are involved with equipment monitoring, and they're involved with policy development and revision. Now, this is the completion of my formal comments for this presentation. Now, what I would like to remind you is Oncology practice management represents 22% of the exam. So there's a wealth of additional information in the handout that I prepared that I wasn't able to cover in this lecture. So I wish everybody good luck in preparing for the exam. And this concludes the presentation and I thank you for your attention.